good morning. It's good to be with you. Put up the last uh, slide for that song, will you, Bill? I want to see it. Oh, God, come with revival. You can start it with me. You know, we sing songs and uh, we say these words and, you know, we kind of mean them. But I wonder if we really mean that one. Oh, God, come with revival. You can start it with me. I want you to think about that for a second. Do you mean that? If you really thought about it, would you, would you say it? Oh, God, come with revival. You start it with me. And I say that because I think as we begin the book of Acts, we need to be ready for God to do that. Individually saying, oh God, come with revival in me, in my church, in my state, in my nation. And if it be your will, I'd love if you start it with me. Let's pray together. Praying the words of Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consume his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all people see his glory. Lord, we want to see your glory. Let revival come and may it start with me. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna invite you, if you'd like to, to get a Bible. Uh, Morgan and your team, if you'd stand up, if you'd like a Bible to follow along, we're on page 1090 in the Bibles we're handing out. It's the book of Acts, chapter one, and you're certainly welcome to open up your own Bible if you bring that, and that's great, especially in this series, or open up an electronic device that has um, the Bible on it, obviously. And so we're going to be beginning the book of Acts. But before we do that, we're actually going to take a quick look at uh, the first verses of the uh, epistle to Luke. Because you may know this. Don't, don't feel dumb if you don't. Not everybody knows this. Um, Luke Acts is kind of a two-chapter book by the same author. Okay, So sometimes it's called Luke Acts. Because Luke, who was a physician, wrote Luke as chapter one or book one, and he wrote Acts as book two. So this Luke-Acts thing, you know, you'll see it when I read just the first four verses of Luke and then the first verses of Acts, that it's a two-part book written by a physician named Luke to a party he knew as Theophilus. So in Luke one, and you don't have to turn to that, I'm just going to read those first few verses, then we'll jump over to Acts. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know this with certainty of the things that have been taught. So that's the way Luke, the physician, starts his gospel. Now, it's interesting because... When you hear the first verses of the book of Acts, um, you'll hear this same thing. And I'm going to read the first 11 verses, then we're going to start pulling them apart. Would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? Now, again, you'll hear him harken back. Listen to the way he starts. In my former book, Theophilus, which is the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is God's word. Please grab a seat. Um, I'm going to stand on the shoulders of one of my favorite preachers, Tim Keller, who talks a little bit about some history things I'm going to be drawing from in this message, some history of what are called revivals or renewals. Um, I don't know how many, were any of you history majors? Any history majors in the room? Okay, a few of you. Um, You might know that in the late 1700s, the uh, late 18th century, something very radical happened in the nation of France. Anybody know what it was? The Great Revolution. And what was happening there was there was a giant disparity between the aristocracy and the peasantry. And as things got worse and as there were particular economic crises that happened there, um, the differences got so that you had these aristocracy, the kings and the queens, Um, living in such opulence, and you had the poor living in such squalor that the tensions became unbearable in France. And what happened was um, there was a revolution, the French Revolution, and uh, it happened in 1789 where it really broke out, and it ran for about 10 years. Now, you may know the story. There was a king that was uh, executed. It was King Louis XVI, who was executed in 1793, and his wife, Marie Antoinette was beheaded a few years later. So that was the French um, Revolution. And by the time what they called the Reign of Terror was over, led by people like Robespierre, um, 16,000, they estimate 16,600 people were killed in that Reign of Terror, many of them by the guillotine. And many more thousands died in prison without a trial. It was a very difficult time in France. Um, Although some of the revolutionary kind of foment that came out of that kind of created the republic of which we are kind of uh, children. So, you know, there were bad things that happened, but also good things as the feudal system kind of ended. But that didn't happen, we all know, in England, did it? England went through a very different thing, and France doesn't have kings and queens anymore, do they? But who does? And we all know because of all the pageantry that's been going on around the queen's death. So what happened in England to keep the revolution from striking the shores of the Isles of Britain? Well, scholars agree that what happened in England was different, and there was no revolution because of something that happened in the 1730s and 1740s called the First Great Awakening, also known as the Evangelical Revival. And so in the early 1700s, a great revival swept through England and swept up all the British Isles, Um, and it's associated with names that you may know if you've been around church for a while. You've probably heard of John Wesley, Charles Wesley, The Methodist movement came out of this period. And one of the great preachers of that period was a wonderful uh, preacher named George Whitfield, who was an Anglican cleric. And he was known for his booming voice in his preaching. And he would preach outside the church. And the church didn't like that because he preached to these open gatherings. And it's kind of the beginning of the revival movement in a way. He was an Anglican priest who at one time spoke to as many as 25,000 people in a period without any voice amplification. I mean, he was known for that. You know, they said he could, you know, his voice would carry so significantly. Um, At that time, about 20% of the people in the British Isles were swept up into the churches through this revival. So about one in five people were converted to Christ and brought into the church. And in that period, there was a tremendous movement with faith of social healing. And so, you know, I've talked to you about this period before and talk about the orphanages that started. Um, It was out of this movement that someone named John or uh, William Wilberforce came, who, of course, was the one who abolished the slave trade in England. That came out of the First Great Awakening or the, this English evangelical revival. Um, child labor law- laws were changed. So it was a remarkable period of renewal of character and of, uh, of goodness in that period following that revival. George Whitfield used to like to uh, close his messages with this line. Come poor, lost, undone sinner, come just as you are to Christ. That was one of Whitfield's great lines. Now, what I want to say to you today is the book of Acts is a period of renewal like that. It's a period of, I shouldn't say renewal, because it's not you know, something that happened before this being renewed, like these great awakenings. It's the first renewal. It's the first movement of God's spirit 
that later re revivals and renewals would kind of revive what happened in the book of, book of Acts. Because what was happening here was, in the book of Acts, powerless people who were believing and preaching things that they had no reason to believe, that weren't natural for them to believe, were spreading these things all over the world, and it changed the world because what they had seen and experienced and told the world as they went out. It was so radical, this movement of these peasants and ne'er-do-wells, basically, that by the uh, early 300s, Roman Emperor Constantine, allegedly, there's some doubt of whether it was genuine, but he converted at least publicly to Christianity, and Christianity became the official state religion by the end of the 300s. From this little sect of people who were persecuted to the state religion in a couple short hundred years. Quite remarkable. And so I'm asking the question today, what caused that kind of social upheaval, that social earthquake that we're still feeling today? What was the power that swept through the first century in this first great awakening of spirituality in the name of Christianity? That's what we're going to see today in our study. And today's passage, we get a first look at it. So let's go ahead and just begin with the first few verses. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, let me just stop right there. Jesus chose his disciples. I mean, we live in a time where nobody wants to be told anything. They, don't, they want their own choices, right? It's freedom of choice. It's my choice. And so let me just ask you, are you ready to be offended this morning? Okay, I'm going to offend you. I hope I can offend you all. I'm actually, I think the Bible's going to offend you. Jesus didn't put out a job application and just let guys choose into his team. Do you know that? He didn't say, hey, whoever wants to get on the team, get on. As a matter of fact, look at this passage in John 15, 16. You did not choose me. Hey, you guys, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. I chose you. The Bible says God does the choosing and we do the responding to his intervention. And you might say, Mark, that's offensive to me. I'm offended. I'm offended that you're saying God does the choosing. Well, I, I just want to say this very nicely. Don't take offense with me. Take it up with Jesus and Paul. Okay? <laughs> look, at, look at what Paul said in Ephesians 1. In Christ, you were also chosen. Okay, you were chosen. Having been predestined, that word people get really scared about. I'm not scared of it at all according to the plan of him who works out everything in the conformity with the purpose of his will. Let me tell you something. Let me just kind of put it this way. If the gospel you believe doesn't offend you on some level, it's not the real gospel. Okay? If the, if the gospel you believe doesn't offend you, it's not the real gospel. It's probably one you made up or someone else has made up and you're watching on YouTube and think it makes sense. Man, and let me tell you why, because man-made gospels don't offend because we make them to our own liking. We make them to tell us things we want to hear. So human-made gospels, we say, well, I'd like to be able to do whatever I want, but be a kind of a nice guy and get into heaven. So that's my gospel. And so we make them up, and they never offend. You know, if you look at the gospels that people make up today, they never take you on. They always tell you things you'd want to hear. The Bible calls that tickling, itching ears. Now, God's in control, and the fact that he's in control, he makes no apologies for. My wife, I always like the way she put it. She said, well, you know, Mark, the way I see it is either God's in control or, I, or we're in control. Okay? Let me just get you a, a basic theology here. God is God, and he's in control. As a matter of fact, here's a great line from your first theology, if you ever write one. It could be this. God is God, and you aren't. Get over it. God is God, and you aren't. Get over it. But there's more in the gospel that's offensive. Have you been offended yet enough? I'm going to keep offending you. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to have an offensive message like this. Um, this one specifically takes on your human pride and my human pride. I, I love this passage. Galatians 5.11. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. Now, what's Paul's point here? He's saying, if I was still preaching that you could get into heaven by these outward rituals, nobody would be against me. Everybody would be saying, hey, we're all saying that. He's saying, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what's happening in your heart. And it's saying, you can't, oh, yeah, here's the core. You can't save yourself. 
you can't do it. You have very little to do with it except to respond. And we go, hey, I want a piece of the action. I mean, I'm not a bad guy. I got some power in here. I want a piece of this. And God says, you can have none of it because it's all me and I'm going to bring you and I'm going to have the power. You can't save yourself. God did it and you have to turn to him because you're lost. You notice the scripture doesn't say we were um, you know, myopic and short-sighted. It says we were blind and it says we were dead in our sins in which we used to live. Okay, another passage, 1 Corinthians 1. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. There's that problem again that he does it all. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Friends, it's just true. The gospel offends human pride. It is a direct affront to our independence and self-sufficiency. Do you see that? Completely an affront to that. Most people, frankly, believe that... um, It is human good works that get you into heaven. Um, Go out and talk to people, and they might mix in some belief, but most say, hey, if you're good enough, you get into heaven. I was reading an article on a page I get, a a news page for pastors, and uh, they did a recent survey of a group of people in church, and they found that 34% of them believe that good works can get you into heaven. Maybe that's not that bad news for you, but those, those were the pastors. 34% of pastors surveyed by Christian Post said you can get into heaven by good works. The false gospel of being good enough to get into heaven is completely powerless. And you know why that is? Because it centers on my power and leaves out God's power. It would be like someone saying, you know, I'm going to go camping uh, next to um, a nuclear power plant. I'm going to get this little 9-volt battery. I'm going to plug it in and try to have a light in my tent. And meanwhile, you got this thing coming with like a jillion gigawatts, you know, that you could plug into and, you know, send your car into the future for that matter. And you know, you're saying, no, but I got my nine volt battery. The power of God, we, when we rely on our power, it's so small. And in terms of meriting anything in heaven, it's not just small, it's non-existent. And that's why, friend, so many churches are dead because they're, le- they're led by pastors who've left behind the power of Christianity, the power to reinvent a life to remake it when a person stops trusting in their power at all. It says, I'm completely bereft of power. God, can you do something? He said, you're right, I can, because I'm the power one, and you're the powerless one. Come to me and get my power. Amen? Amen? That's what we're talking about. Okay, got a hand there. All right, thank you, thank you. Let's keep going. On to verse three. It only gets worse. Okay. (laughs) After his suffering, let me see how far I want to go. After his suffering... He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, let's just talk about this little phrase, he suffered. Um, Right there, right there, word suffered, the center of the gospel. It's right, the center of the gospel, that Jesus suffered, and there's a big theological word. Have you ever heard the word to propitiate or propitiation? That means to satisfy a deity who has some reason to be angry and to satisfy that anger and make him pleased toward you. That's basically what propitiation means. Isaiah predicted it, Jesus fulfilled it, and the Bible and the church teach it. Now, let me make this point again. The kind of Christianity that most people believe is powerful, powerless to create the kind of renewal that the real message of Christ does. And that's what we're looking at here. We're saying, why did this message in Acts create such a worldwide movement, and why every time it's been kind of rediscovered has it created a revival as well? Well, it says, I mean, the false gospel says, believe in God, maybe even believe in Jesus and be good. Or in some forms, it says, be good and believe in Jesus as one way to heaven. Now, that is not what created the change in the book of Acts. It's not what created the first great awakening of the 18th century, and it's not what's going to change our world today. Let's look again at verse 3. I'm going to put it up here. It says, he, Jesus, gave many proofs that he was alive. I don't know how that works. Um, you know, isn't it pretty obvious when someone's alive? But he had to give many proofs he's alive. Why, why would he have to do that? Because they weren't so sure about this whole thing. And here's one of the things we do. I actually heard this thing in the political um, realm the other day on the news. They called it presentism. Have you heard that line yet? And it's this idea that we compare everybody in the past to our current um, 
you know, ethics and morality. So we say George Washington's this, you know, all bad because he doesn't think the way I did as a woke person. That, that's called presentism. Well, it's a little bit of a form of presentism because we think, oh, it, you know, it's so easy for them back then to believe. That must have been just so natural for them to come to believe. Nothing could be further from the truth. And you say, it's so hard to believe today. Nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, they didn't believe in resurrection the way Jesus rose from the dead. They believed, some of them didn't believe in the resurrection. Remember when Jesus said, you know, you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in the power therein. So there were a group of Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. But those who did believe in it believed in a general resurrection at the end of time where everybody who was a believing Jew would rise from the dead, but not an individual resurrection. So this was, they had no category for Jesus rising from the dead and said, okay, this is what resurrection is like. They're going, we have never heard of this. Never, it's not in our categories. So first of all, they wouldn't have naturally understood and believed in resurrection. Secondly, they came to believe that Jesus was God's only son and the third, per, you know, third, second person of the Trinity. They would never have believed that because their whole system was based on monotheism. I mean, they were such radical monotheists that when a guy comes on the scene and says, I'm God, what do they do to him? They kill him. You know, you make yourself equal to God. And so they want to kill him because, you know, the priests are tearing their robes. You say, you can't say that. There's one God and one God only. The whole Shema, you know, there's one God and one God only. That's the core of their beliefs. So this was so completely anathema to their set of beliefs. But they became convinced enough that they believed this message, died for it, and changed the world with it. Now, let's go back to that phrase he suffered. Watered down, fake Christianity says you believe in God, maybe you believe in Jesus, and you try to be good. Real Christianity takes this truth about Jesus' suffering, and it changes you because you realize the great cost Jesus paid to get the sin off your back. Now, this is another modern American religious phenomenon. People think, well, God can forgive sin. That's really easy for him, right? It's like, that's no big deal. That's, I've heard people say, that's his job. Yeah. I wouldn't want to say that to God, but I got this idea also from Keller. Let's say a human judge um, says to a person who's committed a crime against you. Let's say they, they robbed your house or hurt someone you love. And there's this judge and people say, oh, he's a really nice, he's a very loving judge. And the judge says, you know, what's your story? And this person who has, you know, in some way hurt you very badly or taken something from you says, well, Bill, you seem really sorry. And uh, you say you're not going to do it again, so let's just call it even. Now, how would you feel about that? You wouldn't feel good about it, would you? Because wrongdoing has to be set right. Keller's word is there's a residue left by it. If a judge did that, what would we do to him? We would impeach him. And yet we ask the judge of the universe to do the same thing and expect he's going to do that. Let me talk a little bit about another related topic here. I was talking with a man in one of our CLC groups. Uh, that's our Christian Life Concepts groups, the two-year men's discipleship groups that go on here that are, are wonderful. I was talking to this guy. He's, uh, he's one of the founding members of the church. He's an elder. And he said, you know, what I have been learning in my CLC group recently is the depth of my sin. He said, I've always heard about sin, but I'm realizing how deep my sin is within me. Now, if you ask me the top three things that most people in the world don't get about God, in the top three would be the seriousness with which God takes my sin. Because here's the thing most people don't get. The more you see your sin for what it is, the more you're going to fall in love with Jesus for taking it on himself. And the more you see your sin as, it's no big deal, then Jesus' death is no big deal. And for most people in the world, they say it's no big deal because their sin's no big deal. John Newton, who you may know, wrote Amazing Grace. He was a slave trader and was converted, became a pastor, and of course wrote that great hymn. Here's what he said at the end of his life. Although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. When you see the greatness of the suffering of Christ, then there's nothing he can't ask of you, and nothing he can't see you through, because he becomes your first thing, your first love. Let me tell you a story of a gentleman from our church. He moved away some years ago to Florida, and about 12 days ago, he began to have symptoms uh, maybe a stroke, his leg was, he was dragging his leg, you know, his left side was beginning to go numb, his face was dropping, 
went to the doctor, maybe it was a stroke, and then uh, found out it was a brain tumor. And it was a glioblastoma, I believe a stage four glioblastoma that went straight in and deep into his brain. And I've been talking to him a lot over these last uh, 12 days. And when I talked to him at the end of this week, you know, he said something like this to me. He said, Mark, I'm doing fine. He said, you know, I'm concerned about my family, but I'm happy, I'm not suffering, I'm at peace, I'm not worried. And then he said, I want to thank you and the team there at New Community Church because our daughter brought us into this church about 20 years ago and we met Christ and it completely changed our lives. And because of that, we can go through this like that. Because, you know, here's what we do as Christians. Hey, pray for me, I'm sick. Pray for my cousin, he's got a brain tumor. You know what? That's good. We should be praying for those things. But you know what you should be praying for? That they get that kind of attitude that my friend has that can make it through it. That's the thing we should be praying for, that they have a spiritual depth that says, I can go through anything. That's what we should be praying for. Do you know the difference between the man I'm describing and the average person? Most people are holding on to life. And boy, that is just pandemic today. That man is holding on to eternal life. And that can never be taken away from him. And that's why he's doing okay. Which kind of person are you? Because we're surrounded by a world that says, I'm holding on to life. And God says, you better hold on to eternal life because there's no promises about this life. One more part of this chapter that I want to point out to you. Um, Let me read verses four through eight here. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still stuck in that political thing a little bit there. Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. I think he knows they still don't understand it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And here's the part I want to concentrate on. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, There is a very popular idea out there, and that is that all ideas are equal and none are true to the exclusion of others, right? You with me? This relativistic idea that all ideas are true and none are true to the exclusion of others, sometimes called multiculturalism. Jesus didn't teach it, and I don't believe it, and I hope you don't either. Let me just go back to verse 8 and put it up there. Here's what Jesus said. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus doesn't say, preach this to people who are already prone to believe it and who don't have a religious conviction of their own. He says, you go everywhere with this. Here's the way it goes today. What people say if you say, well, Christianity is true, is they say, well, that's true for you, but not for me. You heard that one? That's true for you, but not for me. Let me just help you see the error of that fallacy, because I do believe it's a fallacy. Let's just do uh, something here. Um, If I said this, dark chocolate is better than milk chocolate. How many of you would agree with me? Okay. How many of you would disagree? Okay. Dark chocolate's better than milk chocolate. You know what we can say? It's true for you, but not for me, Mark. Okay, here's another one. Cloudy days are depressing. How many would agree with me? How many would disagree? Yeah, you know what? My wife's a school teacher. When the sun comes in the window of her classroom, they go, what is that globe? (laughs) Close the window. And she goes, what are you, moles? You know, my wife, you know, brought up in the Caribbean. She's like, are are you a bunch of moles? It's the sun, you silly children. (laughs) Cloudy days are, but some people would say, well, that's true for you, but not for me. I like cloudy days. Okay. Uh, How about this one? How many of you like red cars? It's a minority, but there's a few of us. And I might say, red cars are sharp. Clark, were you the one of the ones? Hey, true for you, but not for me. Actually, I like them, but (laughs) true for you. Or your mom says, true for you, but not for me. Those are completely relative things. Puppies make people happy. Okay, anybody say no? Okay, I saw you back there, Laura. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. I was with a guy the other day in the park, and... He's a tough guy. His wife goes to the church. I'm not going to name his name. And he said, you know, I have dogs. I'm not, because the lady with him was talking about it. He said, and I'm not going to use his language. He said, you are a jerk when you're alive and you're a jerk when you're dying because I have to bury you. 
That's tough. So anyway, so that guy would not say puppies make you happy. He, you know, if I said puppies make me happy, and he'd say, well, that's true for you, but not for me. Now, let me try this. Put this up here. Jesus is the son of God, a divine being who died to pay for our sins. His death satisfied God on our behalf. Friends, that can't be true for you and not be true for everybody. That can't, you can't say that's true for you and not for me. Because if it's true, if that's true that he's the son of God, it's true for everybody. And if it's not true, it's true for nobody. Because it's a different category of statement. It's saying this real being came in real time and did a real thing to change our status before God. It's not saying I like red. It's not an opinion-based thing. It's a thing based in history. You can debate it. But if it's true, it's not true for some subset of the human race. It's true for everybody. And if it's false, it's false for everybody. Now, I want to share with you at this point a video because we're talking about renewal and how renewal changed people's lives. And uh, I want to thank Tim Ireland, who's seated right here, for letting me uh, share this video. And when we talked this week and I said, can I share this? He said, my wife said, I can't say no. <laughs> and I said, that's right. I'm really just asking you out of respect. Um, because when you give your testimony, it's kind of God's, and you just can't really say no to it. So, you know, if you ever get baptized, we film you. We will ask, but we really don't mean to. You know, it's, we're just going to use it. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this, because I think this is a compelling story of how renewal happens in a person's life. Take a look. Here. You don't mind, can you hold the mic? Since we're going by age, we're, we're, we're definitely not going by looks. But, uh, I'll try to, to start you look great. So scripture says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Uh, so I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, I did not know Christ for most of my life. And while I've been curious about Christianity, I remained skeptical and frankly just too busy to seek serious answers. I was obsessed with the matters of the material world. This began to slowly change about 10 years ago when I met my wife. She had grown up in the church, and while she accepted me as a non-believer, God never stopped being a central figure in her life. She prayed for us to find a way to a church and come to communion with God as a family. And the years of patience and gentle, pl gentle pressure finally saw their way. And about a year and a half ago, we started to watch some of the online church services that were popular in COVID times. Uh, we joined a uh, new community church in Easter, 2021 service and decided we would try attending in person afterwards. Uh, and our story is a lot like some of those you heard in the video before with Vicki uh, finding us, uh, relentlessly pursuing us. Go, uh, Vicki! And so I was here at New Community Church that I found myself for the first time in God's house with an open heart, ready to hear his message and seeking me. And I was not ready for what happened next. Uh, as I stood searching for God with open heart, I felt the Holy Spirit move within me, calling me and filling me with God's love. And it was the most powerful feeling I've ever had. And uh, thinking about it, it's still emotional for me even now. Since then, through the servings and conversations with Mark, Adam, Joel, and others, through my own Bible readings, and with a healthy dose of YouTube, I've continued my Christian education. I've come to know the truth of the gospel and accept that the Bible is the true word of God. I accept and am eternally grateful that Jesus Christ gave his life for my sins that I might be saved. His love and example have changed my life. Since accepting Jesus, I have a newfound sense of peace and hope in my life. It has changed not only my spiritual outlook, but positively changed my relationships with others, family, friends, and strangers alike. And while Christ's perfection is unattainable, his example is the way to provide you a path to greater peace, forgiveness, and happiness in my life. Now, as Mark says, Jesus commands those who wish to follow him to be baptized. Today I obey his command as a sign of my obedience and faithfulness to Jesus. This is not an act of arrival, but it's rather the start of a journey to follow Jesus. To live in love like him, to better know him, and to grow him. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Woo! Woo! What a story, huh? What a story. God's story in this man's life. Tim, my friend, you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, and you're following him as your Lord. On the basis of this, your profession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Prison to walk in newness of life. That's the power of God. 
That's the power of God in someone's life. That's the power of God in your life when you yield to him and recognize how much you need him. I'm talking about how in the book of Acts there was this great movement of the spirit and in how in history there have been periods of dead church and there's still plenty of dead churches today, but also periods of revival where that same spirit kind of came upon people. One of them I mentioned earlier was the first great awakening or the evangelical awakening in England in the late 1700s. There was another one in Ireland in 1859, and it was called the Ulster Revival. There were about 100,000 converts. It was one-tenth of the total population who were added to the church during this renewal of the spirit in Ulster, Ulster Ireland. Here's the way it's described in one um, narrative on the Ulster Revival. God's spirit moved powerfully in small and large gatherings, bringing great conviction of sin, see that, deep repentance and lasting moral change. Wales also saw one-tenth of the total population turn to Christ, that's 100,000 people. Scotland reported 300,000 conversions, and England had a much larger harvest than that. Crime dropped by half within months. Bars and distilleries were closed because there were no customers. By 1860, judges in Ulster several times had no cases to try, and prostitutes began to get converted. And someone asked them, why are you coming to the church? He said, well, there's two reasons. First of all, business has really radically dropped off. <laughs> and secondly, for the first time on the streets, people are treating us with dignity and respect. So it changed them. Friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest equalizer in the world. Why is that? Because here's our normal way. We compare ourselves to one another and want to win, right? That's the way we do it. But in the gospel, we compare ourselves to God and we say we lose, but we all lose together and then we win in Jesus. Do you hear me? Because we're all equal before God, all equally sinners in need of grace. And so there's no rich or poor, black or white, you know, slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus because we all need him so desperately, so equally, we all need him. That's what created the first wave of the New Testament church. And that's what's created every revival since. Awareness of sin and appreciation of Christ. Always remember what Richard Lovelace said. He was one of my history professors at Gordon Conwell. He said, the depth of your appreciation of sin will correspond to your depth of your appreciation of the death of Jesus Christ and then the depth of the character change in your life. I want to close with the words of uh, George Whitfield, one of his sermons. And I want to say, I hope you're going to be praying with me through this series that uh, God will do something new here. It'll do something new in my life. That, I came in here this morning excited about that. Um, you know, this is a new era of the church, right? We're coming out of COVID. You're all coming back, finding your way back. We've got new leadership that's emerging as, you know, old leadership uh, steps aside. It's a wonderful time to be reinvented as a church and to let God do some new things. So let's just pray that God would make a revival and that we begin with me. Here's what Whitfield said in one of his famous sermons. My dear friends, I would preach to you with all my heart till midnight to do you good till I could preach no more. Oh, that this body might hold out to speak more for my dear Redeemer. Had I a thousand lives, had I a thousand tongues, they should be employed in inviting sinners to come to Jesus Christ. Come then, let me prevail with some of you to come along with me. Come, poor, lost, undone sinner, come just as you are to Christ and say, if I be damned, I will perish at the feet of Jesus Christ where no one has perished yet. He will receive you with open arms. The dear Redeemer is willing to receive you all. Amen? Let's pray together. God, let it rain on us. Let it rain with the power of your spirit how we long to see people come in, people see and receive the love of Christ, no matter what their life situation. People who say, oh, the roof would fall into me. Let them come. We'll build a new roof. It's just not that bad. Come on. Lord, thank you that we have the chance to bring this gospel in its power. Not praying for power, but praying for the gospel, which is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And so, Lord, let this be a period of deep renewal in our hearts, in my heart, in all the leaders' hearts, in all the people's hearts, in the hearts of people who will come in and say, when I walked in that place, I could tell God was there. 
May that be what people say when they walk into New Community Church in this season of our life. And we pray that in the name of the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.